Hiya, I'm Alfie. Um, I'm a, an intern or a trainee with Avon Wildlife Trust working in the North Somerset Rewilding Champions Project, which is a project by North Somerset Council and delivered by Avon Wildlife Trust. Um, so me and the team, which is Joe, um, who will be meeting in a minute, and Arthur, um, we survey and monitor sites around North Somerset that have been rewilded um, with volunteers. So looking at things like plants um, and insect diversity. Um, through my placement, I've learned a lot about bees. And that's what we're going to be learning about tonight with Joe. So she's got a presentation on, on BID and just a general bit about bees, what bees are, some insects that are not bees, that look like bees. Get into it now. So this is Joe. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, my name is Joanna Perry and I am the North Somerset Rewilding Champions Project Assistant and um, this BID session is available for everybody um, and so you can learn about bees and insects that look a little bit like bees and hopefully by the end of this you'll know the difference between a few insects. Two, two. Right, sorry about that. Yeah. Here we go. What is a bee, you may ask? Bees belong to the order Hymenoptera, and that involves insects like sawflies, social wasps, parasitoid wasps, and ants. Now they all have this particular structure. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. These wasps and sawflies all have four wings, and not all ants have wings, some of them have four. And a way that, um, in particular, honeybees um, warm or cool down their hive is they're flapping all their wings, just controlling the temperature as they go. Now, um, a bee was encased, for the evolution, a bee was encased in amber, and they believe it to be 100 million years old which means that they were around with the dinosaurs. Now, bees and flowers, plants, all coincide with each other. You can't have one without the other. They've co-evolved. Um, and this is called classic mutualism. Now, mutualism means that the relationship between bees and plants benefit each other. And bees have evolved from carnivorous wasps. They were once meat eaters, and somewhere along the line, they became vegetarians and started drinking nectar and pollen. So flowers provide bees with pollen and nectar to eat. And by spreading the pollen from flower to flower, some pollen sticks to the bees' legs. And this means that the bees are pollinating each flower. Now, some bees can see in ultraviolet light, which means they can't see certain colors. And generally, they focus on yellow and purple flowers. You can see here, there's a carder bee on a purple flower. Now, Many bees have this pollinating method called buzz pollination. And hopefully I'm going to show you a video of what it is like.
doing is sonication. buzz but bumblebees are one of the very few types of bees that actually take that buzzing sound and use it like a secret weapon to get pollen in fact what the bumblebee is doing is sonication buzz pollination it's a technique that it's adapted to get pollen that other bees can't get certain flowers are specially adapted to keep their pollen high up in the flower and a bumblebee can't actually reach that with his legs or with his tongue. So what it needs to do is vibrate to get that pollen to fall down. And how this works is they unhinge their wings from their flight muscles and vibrate their muscles really, really rapidly, creating an angry that causes the pollen to fall down onto their bodies. And they fly onto another flower and do the same thing. That's a superpower as far as I'm concerned for bumblebees. You have a regulator in your... Lovely. I think that's a really good video. So... So yeah, um, not all, um, it's not just bees that pollinate, you get wasps, flies, moths, and butterflies, and even beetles are pollinators. Some are accidental, they don't mean to, but because they've got hairy legs, that's what they do. Now, a little fact for you, it takes 12 honeybees their lifetime, one year, to produce one teaspoon of honey. Now you see all that honey on the shelves, you can think how many bees have, has it taken to produce all that honey. It's pretty amazing. Now, bees in Britain, there are actually 260 species in the UK, and the majority of them are, are solitary bees. There are 35 that are near extinction, um, and they're and all bees are cold-blooded, so they adapt to their environment. And despite the name, solitary bees, um, the mother has daughter bees that help her um, with the young in the nest. And they help collect pollen for their siblings. 70% of bees are mining bees and nest in burrows underground. The males emerge first and wait for the females. They mate and then die fairly quickly after. So it's not, not much of a life cycle for the workers and the drones, which I'll tell you more about in the next slide. So these are vital pollinators and they do actually produce a lot of our food. So all the fruit trees, all the crops that we grow, even cider, as some would say, because they help pollinate apple trees. They do a lot for us, and so we really need to look after them, because without bees, we wouldn't have much food to eat or drink to drink. There are threats to bees, which include habitat loss and fragmentation. So as a lot of bees are ground dwelling. Um, a lot of human trampling, building, all that kind of stuff is um, destroying all the bees' homes, sadly. And 97% of our wildflower meadows in the UK have disappeared. It's due to scrub, due to not managing the grassland. And well, for building, um, in areas and roads, in fact, actually break up habitats. Um, and but because of this project, the rewilding champions project, um, there is rewilding areas along the roads 
which is indeed actually connecting um, the paths, the corridors, so that bees can actually get to their next destination. Um, bees can actually fly five miles for food. So it is necessary for us to keep these wildflower um, corridors going. Now, something also that affects bees is pesticides. Um, and there has been talk of getting rid of pesticides, like North Somerset Council has banned pesticides in certain areas, like Western Supermare and Portishead. Um, another threat to bees is climate change. Um, in the summer this year, we've had quite a drought. We've had a good couple of heat waves that have made flowers grow quicker and that, um, so they're producing pollen quicker, dying earlier, so there's not enough flowers to go around for the bees. And this is also affecting the numbers because bees and flowers obviously must coincide. So how can we help? Well, you can provide more flowers to feed the bees. There are many seed bombs, wildflowers in various shops. Um, you can leave your own garden untidy or even just a section of grass can be rewilded and you can see what sort of wildflowers pop up and not using chemicals in your garden and using peat-free compost because there's chemicals in um, <clears throat> in other types of compost. And wherever you can, buy organic produce. Okay. Bee lines, there's a bee line project in the North Somerset area, which is part of Bug Life. And they've teamed up with Avon Wildlife Trust. And they focus efforts in these red areas pictured here to help link all the wildlife corridors from the coast to the hills. And this is a particularly important thing that we should be doing, and it's vital to avoid extinction. There are bee line corridors all over the UK. If you'd like to find out, then you can look at your local wildlife trust area or bug life website and type in where you live, and then you can find out where there's bee lines in your area. Now, the project Rewilding in North Somerset. North Somerset Council have um, decided to give 25% of their amenity grasslands, that's grassland that they mow every two weeks in parks and roadsides, all that kind of stuff. Some of it is to keep visibility on the roads. So in some areas it will absolutely have to be mown, but they have given 25% up for wildlife to try and help with climate change. And this allows um, plants to flower and grasses to seed and also gives some habitat for any species that want to breed. They can breed happily without the fear of being moved. And ongoing monitoring, which is what we've been doing since March, um, is actually showing a big difference in the amount of insects that are in these areas. Um, and soon we'll be able to analyse all our data and make it public for everyone to see. Now, we can't do this monitoring without our lovely local volunteers. We've got groups in Western Supermare, Wirral, Nailsey, Portishead and Clevedon. And the title champion is giving them leadership in their own local areas and they're able to monitor the areas which we've chosen and produce data for future um, knowledge. And, and they're all really lovely and you should come out and meet them. 
Right, should we get down to the identifying of bees? So we have social bees, which are the bumblebees and the honeybees. And so bumblebees, there are 24 species in the UK with seven that are the most common you'll see most about in your garden and in parks. Uh, a good way of identifying bees is by their tail. Tails vary between bees. And they have two or three castes, castes meaning family members. So you have the head of the family, the queen, then you've got the worker, which is the female workers, and the drones, which are males. And some of them in the family, they do look similar, but there are variations. And we'll focus on the most common. So the queen emerges from hibernation in the spring and starts the colony by laying a few eggs, which hatch as workers. These workers are sterile, and they tend to the young and the nest, keeping it clean and tidy and controlling the temperature. The males emerge a bit later. They are fertile males and they mate with the future prospective queens. The very few bees that the queen has made fertile. How she does that, I don't know. Queens can live for two to three years. And both the drones and workers die in one, one season, one year. They die off in the autumn and the new queens disperse. They go and hibernate through the winter and then they'll create their own nest and the family tree goes on. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, it has two stripes one behind their head and one across the abdomen. They are orangey in colour. Um, the tail varies. The queen has a buff, same colour as the two stripes um, on the tail. Um, and then the workers and the drones, actually you, you might be able to see this, but there's a very faint buff coloured line in between the black and the white on the abdomen. And that's how you can identify them as buff-tailed bees. They have <clears throat> short tongues, so they prefer um, open flowers, such as the buttercup pictured here. And um, they're also called nectar robbers, which means um, if desperate, they will bite into a deeper flower and nick the nectar and the pollen from there. Not <clears throat> So the white-tailed bumblebee, Bombus leucorum, uh, they have two yellow stripes, <clears throat> one behind the head and across the abdomen, and the stripes are brighter than buff-tailed. So the difference here with the tail is the tail is completely white. <clears throat> and this is a male pictured. You see it, or it has a yellow face as well. The female workers don't have a yellow face. These bees like clover and comfrey, and they are also nectar robbers, so they will bite into deeper flowers if they want. <clears throat> the garden bumblebee, Bombus hotorum, um, has a long proboscis tongue. It's one of our larger, larger bees, and their tongue can go into flowers such as foxgloves and bluebells and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the way to differentiate the garden bumbles from rural, which we will come to in a minute, is their mandible. Mandible means moustache. So the garden bumblebee has a black moustache, whereas the rural has a ginger touch. The bombus barbutellus pictured underneath is actually a cuckoo bumble and it predates on the garden bumblebees young. They will place their larvae into the garden bumblebees nest and yeah they will eat the bumblebees young. So early bumble 
This is Bombus praetorum. It's our smallest bumblebee. They have yellow bands on the thorax and abdomen and have an orange tail. They are the earliest bee to emerge, um, <clears throat> emerging in March to June. And they prefer flowers such as hazel, primrose, lavender, and McCormick's daisies. <clears throat> Here we have the red-tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius. This is a male bumblebee, again with the yellow face and a bright red tail. Now the queens and the female workers are all black, very fluffy, all black with a red tail, like that one. Um, and the males also have a moustache like this one here. Um, so do not mistake it for the red-tailed cuckoo bee, Bombus rupestris, which is this one here. It's not got as many hairs um, and it doesn't collect pollen and they predate on the red-tailed bee's offspring. Next, we have the ruderal bumblebee, which is Bombus ruderatus. They are one of our largest bumblebees and they're found in the south of England. So we see them a lot in North Somerset. And they are similar to the garden bee, but as I've already stated, they have a ginger tash. Really sorry, could not find a picture. They also have a long proboscis, so they can take pollen from foxgloves, honeysuckle, and snapdragons. The tree bee, Bombus hypnorum, uh, the thorax is ginger and their tail is white. They don't have so many hairs in the middle on the black. The males are twice the size of the honeybee and it makes a patch of yellow. The males have a patch of yellow facial hair. So they have a yellow mandible. You will see the queen looking around for a nest in March to April. And they like the dangly flowers such as raspberry and comfrey. The common card of bumblebee is one of my favorites, Bombus buscorum. They are very fluffy and ginger in color. They are one of three all ginger bumblebees and they have black bands that may be visible on the abdomen. <clears throat> they can be seen between March and November and they like forget-me-not, hazel, ivy and lavender. <clears throat> and then you have the brown banded carded bee, Bombus humilis, the rarest of the carded bumblebees. Um, and you can see here on the abdomen, there's the brown band that differentiates them from um, the other two carder bees. Sorry about that. They are found in open wildflower meadows. And this is why they're quite rare because we don't have many wildflower meadows anymore. And they like in particular red barksia, clover and knapweed. And then you have the moss card of bumblebee, which is Bombus muscorum. They are quite yellowy in colour with a very ginger thorax. They are mainly northerners, so you'll see them in places such as like Manchester, Nottingham, all that kind of place. But you do see them here along the coast. They have no black hairs on the abdomen and they are the largest of the three card of bumblebees and they also like um, clover, knapweed and red barks here. Hmm. So beyond the bumblebees we have the honeybee. Um, so it's got a familiar black gold barring. They are smaller and slimmer than the bumblebees. There is a few wild colonies in the UK, some are in wooded areas, um, and you can see them between March and September. They are like comfrey, lavender, buddleia, and scabious, amongst other flowers. Mm. 
then you've got the so solitary bees. So like I said, there's 70% are mining bees with 65 species in the UK that live in underground burrows. They have short pointed tongues. Uh, they don't have any colonies or a queen and they don't use wax. They have various materials to construct their cells and nests. And they are excellent pollinators. One red mason bee can pollinate as much as 120 honeybees. And their small pollen sacs mean they drop more, so pollinate more flowers. There we go, the buzz pollination method. Now, early mining bee, Adrena Humor. They have bright ginger hairs on the thorax. They have a dark abdomen with a red tail and one of the earliest species seen. They fly from March to July and they feed on early flowers like willow, hawthorn and dandelion. And they also like fruit trees. So the ashy mining bee, Andrina cinerea, they have two gray bands on the back and a lovely grey moustache at the front for the males. And they close nest holes once they're finishing foraging for the day when they're disturbed. And they fly from April to early August. The females can be seen in groups and this makes for better protection for predators or a single females. So, they're predated by the Lafrey's nomad bee, which doesn't look much like them at all, but there you go. That is the Lafrey's nomad bee. And then you have the red mason bee, Osmia bicornis. They are the most familiar solitary bee. They have dense reddish ginger hair and they're on the wing from late March. So the name comes from the tendency to nest in crumbling water in buildings. And after mating, this solitary bee creates a nest by lining the cells with mud and pollen. They like crab apples, elderberry, dandelion, borage, and meadow cranes. Hmm. The patchwork leaf cutter bee is the most common of the leaf cutters. They have a bright orange under, underside, which is, you can clearly see the arrow pointing there. They are on the wing, April to August, and they nest in holes in warm spots. They use leaf sections, in particular roses, uh, to, warm, to make a door for their chambers, each containing a single egg, which they have supplied a little bit of pollen and nectar. And this helps protect them from predators. They carry the pollen on the underside of their abdomen and they pollinate fruit trees, also like knapweed, thistles, burdock and roses. Like I've just said, they like to cut the leaves off roses. Now the wool card bee is the only solitary card bee. They have hairs on the edges of the thorax and the abdomen and little yellow spots on either side. Uh, they build their homes using plant materials such as lamb's ear. They'll just pick the hairs off and line it in their nest. They are seen from May to August and they're common throughout southern England. Male bees do not sting but they do have a set of spikes on their abdomen that they can use to protect um, the female that they're mating with and their patch. So they feed on betony, windwort, mint, and rest harrow. The yellow face bee, you may not know much about. It does look similar to a wasp, um, and they are virtually hairless. They do not have a scoper, which is the sack on the leg. No. So they basically eat the pollen and then regurgitate it to their young. They line their nests with this strong protected silk that 
they produce themselves and they paint it on the walls with their proboscis. They nest in hollow twigs and wood and their diet consists of brambles, wild carrot, thistles and oxide daisy amongst other things. So a bee or not a bee? Mm, wasps. This pictured here is the yellow jacket wasp or Vespula vulgaris. They are also valuable pollinators. They help us by preying on pests and farmers use them to protect their crops. They have a distinctive yellow and black pattern, can look quite evil. Uh, most are solitary and non-stinging, believe it or not. The yellow jacket here is a social wasp. Parasitoid wasps, such as the Ichneum wasp, is actually a non-stinging one. And social wasps have a queen, just like the bumblebees. These are hoverflies um, or flower flies. They are true flies called dipteran and they will hover in the air above flowers. They mimic bees and wasps, so you know, be careful. It's like, oh, there's a bee. No, it isn't. It's a hoverfly. <laughs> um, they, are, they have, one way to differentiate them is they have huge eyes pictured here. That's a big giveaway. And they are also valuable pollinators. They don't have much of a life. They live about 12 days. And the most common is the brown banded hoverfly surface ribesi. So you've got the bee fly here, Umbilius major. They look really cute, but they are also parasitoids to solitary bees and wasps. The larvae of the bee, bee fly eating the larvae of the bees and the wasps it predates. So, on, they're on the wing between March and May, and a particular organisation called Soldier Flies and Allies Recording Scheme asks the general public to record bee flies on iRecord. So getting involved in our project, there has been monthly surveys taking place across North Somerset. The volunteers carry out surveys on other patches too, and uh, because there's many rewilding areas, we've just picked seven for the project. The rewilding champions will coordinate and collect data, and they learn various species of flowers, grasses, pollinators, and other insects. There are other ways to get involved in identifying and recording bees. And there's a bee fly watch, that's the um, forum that you can record your bee fly sightings and there's an app called iNaturalist which you can upload a photo of what you've seen and there are many experts that can help you identify what the species of, is if you don't know. Um, there is um, a bee walk which is organised by the Bumblebee Conservation Trusts and it's a national monitoring scheme so there will be one in your area. Check it out. And there's also pollination, which is a citizen science project to promote pollinator friendly gardening. So if you want to get involved in that, do. Um, for us, you can email the North Somerset Rewilding at avonwildlifetrust.org.uk if you want to get in touch, or you can head to the avonwildlifetrust.org.uk NS Rewilding webpage. Or alternatively, as, as it is the North Somerset Council's project, you can go to their page, which is Rewilding North Somerset, North Somerset Council, northsomerset.gov.uk. And thank you very much for watching.